Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Dr. Tommy Linsari. Dr. Linsari is a research associate at the Canadian Rivers Institute and Department of Biology, University of New Brunswick. He completed his undergraduate and Master's of Science degrees at the University of Helsinki and received his PhD from UNB. Both his uh, Master's and his PhD theses examined aspects of Atlantic salmon ecology. Dr. Linsari is a fish ecologist and his current work examines the effects of anthropogenic impact on rivers related to climate change, hydropower and other manipulations of flow due to consumptive and non-consumptive uses. He is also interested in behavior and movements of fishes, both in natural and in hydropower impacted rivers. He currently co-leads the Mactaquac Aquatic Ecosystem Study at UNB, where he supervises undergraduate and graduate students, postdocs, and staff. After the presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Linsari. Thank you, Darla, and uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so, as Darla was alluding to, um, I'm actually trying to uh, squeeze into today's webinar, um, I'm trying to squeeze in two stories, really. Um, so first, I'm going to start off talking about the Mathaquac Aquatic Ecosystem Study. And I'll be referring to, as you see here on the screen, to maize because the the whole whole study is really a mouthful. So when I say maize, I'm I'm referring to the our study. So I'll try to describe why we embarked on um, on this maize study, why we think it's a big deal, and um, what what is it that we're actually doing. And since the webinar series is co-hosted by the Atlantic Salmon Cons. Conservation Foundation, uh, I thought it's only appropriate then to pick up one of the um, one of the studies um, specifically regarding uh, the Atlantic salmon and, and talk uh, about that specific study in a little bit more detail. However, we are still in the middle of a data collection for, for all our studies, so I will not go into the really nitty-gritty uh, details on the salmon study either because simply all the numbers are not in yet, and I don't want to jump the jump the gun, if you will. And and me talking about Atlantic salmon or picking that particular study does not imply that we think that that is somehow the most important study. Um, but yeah, I, I thought uh, for this webinar series it would be appropriate to to talk about that a little bit. So. Um, I'm, I'm thinking I, I probably will go today around 40, 45 minutes, and I don't want to take the risk to uh, run run over time and not uh, have the appropriate time to acknowledge the the foundation and, and the organization who make our uh, studies possible. And so, so we the May studies are are funded by um, a host of organizations. Um, I, I want to mention uh, the ones in particular you see in the screen and be power and NSERC. Um, but but then on the other end, um, many many smaller organizations like the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, uh, New Brunswick Wildlife Trust Fund, UMB Environment Canada, the province of New Brunswick, and uh, NBIF New Brunswick Innovation Foundation. So what is the MAES project? And I'll start by, um, I'm not sure who is listening into this, but um, I have here on the upper hand corner, I have a, a small map. So, so Mactaquac Aquatic Ecosystem Study is about the Mactaquac Generating Station. So, so and I'll refer to that as MGS, so the, the, or the dam, if you will as well. Uh, so the, the Mactaquac Dam is located here in the, um, the provinces of New Brunswick, so we're here in Atlantic Canada. And uh, Mactaquac is the lowermost um, hydropower dam in the St. John River system, uh, and so it's located here. Uh, it is one of, of three main stem uh, dams. We have another dam here. Um, 
that is, is going to be uh, relevant for the Atlantic Salmon Study, the Tobik Narrows um, Dam as well. And uh, so a little bit about the St. John River. St. John River watershed is, is relatively large. We have the river is um, international, so it's part in, in, in Canada, part in the United States, and some parts are here in the, in the, in the province of Quebec. Um, it's 673 kilometers long. It drains an approximate area of 55,000 um, square kilometers. And uh, sometimes I hear the, the, because of the large size, St. John River is referred to as the, uh, the Rhine of North America. Um, so then focusing on the, uh, the, the Mactaquac Dam in itself, so the Mactaquac Dam is actually quite recent dam. It, was, it became uh, operational in 1968, and it's a relatively large dam. Um, in, in terms of volume, it's the 25th largest in Canada, and it, it has, uh, has a, it produced quite a bit of power. So it's, the main plate capacity is 672 megawatts uh, produced by the six Kaplan turbines. It is like measuring right on the, on the top here from bank to bank uh, over a kilometer long. It's 55 meters high, so it is, um, it is a large dam. And um, Mactaquac is producing somewhere between 12 to 15 percent of, um, of energy in, in New Brunswick. So it is, it is quite a significant dam. Now, what is going on with the Mactaquac Dam is that um, the concrete parts of the dam are, are coming to the end of life uh, uh, and uh, the end of life or the end of service life is currently predicted to be around 2030. So since it would, was built only in 1968, it is, uh, it is, we can say it's coming to the end of service life uh, prematurely. And that is because um, they're at the concrete parts, they are being affected by this uh, AAR reaction or the alkali aggregate reaction. So what is that? And I'm not an engineer, um, but the, the quick sort of uh, AAR in a nutshell really is that uh, it is a, a process where the, uh, the concrete paste is reacting um, with the silica in the, um, in the sand gravel mix that was used when the concrete was mixed. And, and now this AAR is causing um, the concrete to swell and crack over time, and therefore bringing the um, the concrete parts now into premature uh, end of life. So let's see if I can flip on to the next next slide. So 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 then the question begin uh, becomes the concrete parts are coming to the end of service life. Life now what do what do you do with an aging dam? And the new NB Power, who is the owner operator of the dam, um, they presented three future options for the dam, and and we're going to talk about. I'm going to show you a, little, a couple more slides about these options. But the three options that were originally presented were um, to repower, to retain the head pond, or basically build a water con control structure and not generate power, but still keep um, the reservoir, or a complete river restoration or removal of the dam in its entirety. And, and then uh, NB Power decided to uh, partner with the Canadian Rivers Institute and the, the UMB on uh, trying to see what, do, what would these three options mean in terms, in terms of the um, river ecology. And we're now working on what we call a phase one and helping NB Power um, to provide river science and, and therefore like choosing the option uh, for the future of the dam. I want to quickly show this. This is a very busy slide and I don't know that um, you, can't, you can't read all of them, but the point I want to make here is that our MAES studies are only a small part <coughs> of um, NB Power's um, Mactaquac project. We would be fools to think that it is only the river science that will uh, determine what NB Power decides to do uh, with this um, with the Mactaquac Dam. There are clearly many different aspects. There are social considerations. 
the financial considerations, um, well, the, inner, uh, the environment, uh, energy policy, and um, other public inputs like app original inputs that NB Power is considering uh, when, when they're making this decision. And our studies uh, at Canadian Rivers Institute are only providing this um, input on the river science so that uh, the decision making becomes uh, science based uh, with that regard. I borrowed this graph from NB Power's um, white paper. So for their durable, uh, for the decision, it is really multiple um, aspects that they, they will have to consider to come up with the eventual uh, decision. And they are hoping to come up with the, the decision between the three options by the, uh, by the end of this year. <clears throat> so a little bit more about the options. So this is the, the current dam in the St. John River. Uh, it has the concrete parts, but it also has this earthen part of the dam. And I just want to point out that there is currently nothing uh, wrong with the earthen part of the dam. So this is structurally sound. Uh, it is just the concrete parts that are being affected by this AAR. So the three options presented for the, for the future um, are as follows. And, and I, I'm, I'm showing these renderings that I've, I'm borrowing from NB Power. I just want to point out that these are by no, no means final engineering drawings. These are just uh, renderings to give uh, a little bit of an idea of what these uh, different options, how, how they might look like. So the repower option means that there would be a new powerhouse constructed probably on the other side of the river where it's, where so it current, the current powerhouse is on, on this location. And there would be a spillway structure um, again, uh, just looking an aerial view, this would mean that the new structures would be here on the, on the south bank of the, um, of the St. John River, and these purple parts would be the ones that would be uh, removed. There is an option that there might be another um, spillway also on the, uh, on the north side, on the repower option. The second option is retaining the headphone, so that means uh, that there would only be a, a water control structure that would be constructed, but not generating um, hydropower from this facility. And, and really, um, why this option uh, is being considered is that the reservoir, um, there's obviously a lot of recreational use. There are marinas, a lot of uh, users, and a lot of reservoir. So it is in consideration NB Power wanted to, um, to look and see how um, how the river science would look if if um, if this option would, would be chosen. Again, very similar in the aerial view, except that the uh, here we would only have the water control structure, uh, no powerhouse on the on the uh, the south bank of the river. Then perhaps the, the biggest change in the current situation would be the option three, which is the river restoration, and that would mean uh, to remove the concrete structures, but also the earthen dam part in its entire, in, in entirety, and, and then um, let the river return to an open, open flow condition and return, return to a, some new normal, um, and, and close, but pro probably close to the, uh, the historic condition. And, and roughly what this would mean that, um, again, really preliminary calculations show that maybe uh, roughly 40, uh, sorry, 54 uh, square kilometers would be, um, uh, of, of currently inundated land would be exposed and, and the river would be uh, back to its normal, normal or, or historic state. Since the option three is probably the, um, the, the biggest change to the current one. I just want to show you guys um, this slide to talk about. So, how does how would the dam removal scenario compare to the situation of of uh, uh, seen elsewhere? As you know, uh, dam removals are becoming more common. Um, so, we we had actually um, we had a look of large dam removals elsewhere to see how how the Macquarie project uh, would compare and. Um, Currently, the largest dams removed anywhere in the world are in the Elva River in the Washington State. There was two dams, uh, but the bigger one of them was the Kleins Canyon Dam that was removed uh, very recently. 
and here I'm comparing the some vital numbers of Mactaquac Dam and the Glens Canyon Dam. And, and here on the map, I just want to, it, it doesn't show very, uh, it's not very apparent on my map here, but what I'm trying to show here, Lake Mills was the reservoir um, behind the Glines Canyon Dam, and I'm indicating the size of the Lake Mills here with the blue color. And I'm superimposing it on this, uh, so this big thing that looks like a fishing hook is the, uh, is the Mactacrack Reservoir, uh, at least the lake-like portion of it. So, so it is quite apparent from, from here that, um, so Lake Mills is the, the reservoir uh, from, the, from the dam removal project that is currently the lar largest in the world. So it is obvious that we're, we're talking about the project, uh, if it was a dam removal, that is an, an order of magnitude larger than, than um, any existing dam removal project uh, until now. I just wanted to put that in a little bit of a context uh, so uh, we know what we're talking about here. So, so then uh, what really is May's project? So what we want to do uh, at Canadian Rivers Institute is to understand the whole river ecosystem and what these three options would mean for the river. And we have sort of put, it, put our studies in the three uh, different compartments the whole ecosystem studies, fish passage studies, and environmental flows. The key outputs uh, at the end of this phase one is uh, these deliverables to NB Power that we hope that will be helping them in their decision making. A very important part for, for our work is the, um, the training of the highly qualified personnel. So these are our graduate study uh, students, the PhD master students, uh, the postdoctoral fellows. So at the end of phase studies, um, we will have 49 young, um, smart individuals trained for aquatic river sciences. And of course, uh, it is important to do proper dissemination of the results, both to the public but also for the wider scientific community. And, and as of today, we've, um, we've compiled 27 reports, theses, or, or um, peer-reviewed submissions uh, during our phase one um, right now. So where are, we, where are we focusing on the MAS here again is the, the province of New Brunswick. So this is really our focus area here, a sort of a, and uh, the city of Fredericton, uh, the, the provincial capital, is actually just roughly 20 kilometers downstream of the Mactaquac Dam. So our focus study area is the 20 kilometer area between the city of Fredericton and the Mactaquac Dam. But really we have studies ranging from, um, from the Topeak River uh, downstream in the head pond side and all the way really to the river mouth, as, as you'll see in, uh, in a few uh, or in the next few slides that are to follow. But again, the 20 kilometer section is really our focus area. Why this is really dynamic environment as well is, um, I, I just wanted to mention that um, St. John River is actually tidal up to, um, up to very close to the dam. So, so we do have the tidal uh, fluctuation coming from the downstream end. And of course, Mactaquac generating station is a hydro peaking um, operating facility, so, so again, it causes daily fluctuation from the, from the upstream end, so it, it really creates as a very, very dynamic and difficult environment to model and, and carry our studies in. Who is doing the studies? Um, I just want to point out a few key people. So what, who we have here uh, is uh, Professor Alan Curry, who is really what I call the head of the snake. Uh, in the Mactaquac study, so he is the principal investigator um, of the Mactaquac study. We're blessed to have Gordon Yamasaki as a project manager. Why I'm very happy to have Gord uh, as our project manager is that Gord speaks fluent engineerish, and he also speaks fluent scientist. So he can actually translate um, the science, the academic talk to the engineers and the vice versa, and, and uh, that is very useful uh, as well. Then we have Wendy and me who are also, um, we are co-research associates here at the UMB and, and co-leading the study with Alan. We have self-imposed ourselves a 
Science Advisory Board. Again, just to ensure that all our studies are really um, up to par and transparent and scientifically sound. So, so here are a few people who are actually annually monitoring and evaluating our work and seeing that uh, we are doing the best science possible. Jeff Duda is actually, um, he has been very uh, deeply involved in that uh, Elwa Dam removal project. So we're really happy to have a really internationally high caliber science advisory board monitoring our, our research. The project team, there's a lot of projects and, and these are the, um, the, 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 um, the scientists who are supervising a, a whole host of graduate students here at UMB and also in the INRS and um, in Quebec City where Andre saint Hilaire is, is working. But really where the focus is, is, is highlighted here. It is the, that team of graduate students and, um, and postdoc, postdocs that, that really are doing most of the work and, and, um, and are, are making all this happen. So every summer where, where our work really peaks, we are anywhere from 45 to 50 people in the team undertaking all these studies. We also work with, uh, with a lot of partners, uh, a lot of companies, a lot of other universities and research institutions um, that, uh, that are vital for, for the success of our study. So I'll try to very briefly um, walk through some of the studies we are we're doing. As I mentioned, so we have, we have uh, built the studies really around the three, three umbrellas, the whole ecosystem studies, fish passage studies, and environmental flow studies. And again, in the whole ecosystem study part, we are looking at the river Rhine environment downstream of the dam and then the reservoir environment upstream of the dam and we have a, a whole host of projects uh, in all of these, um, all of these subcomponents. So I'll, I'll briefly try to walk through uh, in, in very broad terms uh, what different studies we are undertaking in under these three different uh, categories of maize projects. And, and then at the end I'll be focusing a little bit more on this Atlantic salmon part of the fish passage studies. Study, sorry. So in the whole ecosystem part, so there's a really four components. The first one to uh, really understand the downstream part of the river or define the river. So we have really done a lot of work, uh, just basic, uh, basic science, trying to understand what does the river look like, collecting the bathymetry data everywhere in this challenging um, environment. There's a lot of islands, a lot of shallow areas, um, mapping also the substrate sizes and, and a whole host of other physical variables. And um, so we've been using sonars to collect the bathymetry data. Um, and actually the first thesis that is about to be finished actually in, uh, in the matter of next two weeks was, uh, was looking at the, um, the validity of, of the data. On, so the, the, the depth soundings, the substrate mapping, the aquatic macrophyte mapping that the, the sonar units are collecting and, and making, um, comparing uh, the sonar interpretation to an actual manual observations to make sure that the data we are collecting is, is good. And, um, and, and we are really happy, especially, and, and kind of positively surprised, especially with the macrophyte um, mapping that how accurate data the units are able to collect and as, as compared to the manual observations, and of course the depth, uh, depth data were also really good. We, we will have to go back to the drawing board on the substrate and, and do sub, new, new substrate mapping uh, this year because the substrate mapping was not as accurate as we had thought. Um, other studies that we're doing just to define the river is a lot of transect measurements. By now we have measured hundreds of locations in this 20 kilometer section. Anywhere, so these are your uh, depth measurements, velocity measurements, DOs, pH uh, measurements, uh, secchi depths, um, and, and those are measured a number of times in each summer. 
So again, we, we can then start to populate our models and try to try to make predictions based on those, those values. The baseline and metric studies in the whole ecosystem part <clears throat> tries to really look at everything that possibly could be using the Riverine environment. So, so the baseline studies and the metrics really um, are stemming from the benthic macroinvertebrates to uh, various fish species that we collect by electrofishing and, and net, uh, sailing, tight netting, and all, um, and a variety of other ways. We are doing macrophyte studies. We are conducting river metabolism uh, studies. We will start uh, to look at freshwater mussels this summer. Um, and we also have a fairly extensive um, stable isotope study planned. Um, so we, we, we have a few areas that, where we call, that we call super sites where we collect all these samples and they are feeding at the end of the day thousands of samples to the isotope uh, study so we can construct uh, food webs and understand how the river is working uh, and how these different parts are, are interconnected. I will quickly show just the one example of the baseline studies that is regarding the, the, the macrophytes, so the, the aquatic plants. Again, um, so we have collected the, the macrophyte presence absence data using sonars. Now it is being field uh, validated and, and, and generally are showing really good results. Um, what we have found out, again, on this just particular example, that roughly 44% of the, of the wetland area is covered um, by some macrophyte uh, assemblages. Uh, we are able to look at the biovolumes in different areas and now, now are in the process of um, connecting these to the ecohydraulic uh, approaches. So how do the different macrophyte assemblages relate to the flow uh, and depth? And, and this is uh, work being undertaken by uh, one of our postdocs, Dr. Megan Bruce. And ultimately, we again try to get to the question, so three different uh, future scenarios are being presented. And, and try to make those predictions how, for example, macrophytes would respond in future to, to these different um, alternative future scenarios. Again, as, as many of you can um, uh, appreciate, macrophytes are directly linked to the abundance of benthic macroinvertebrates and, and where the fish are hanging out. So, so we are making those connections and links and try to try to do those predictions. Another example um, here, and, and my, my presentation here is a little backwards because I haven't talked about the hydrodynamic models yet, but of course, um, one, another important component that our uh, river defining studies are doing is related to the, um, the fish habitat under the, 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 uh, the future scenarios. What we are using, because we're looking at the fairly large area and that the St. John River is fairly large, we're using a, a mesohabitat approach. The model we're using is a meso casimir model. It's based on a fuzzy logic um, uh, mathematics or statistics, if you will. We'll be using multi-expert input to this. I will not be going to the details, try to explain this in, in high detail. But again, the take-home message here is that um, we're, we're building models so that we can predict how the future would uh, um, under all under these different scenarios and how much habitat would be available and for which uh, fish species uh, under these future scenarios. So that was the downstream part what we we're working on. Um, now in the upstream part we have um, a little bit of a different set of study. Well again in the upstream part we started off with uh, mapping the, the bathymetry or the, the depth zones with quite high detail so we can understand uh, how much and, and how the, the river looks like um, under the, uh, the 30 to the 40 meters of water in the, in the reservoir. Um, and then the sediments are, are of course very important part of, of our upstream studies um, and in, in particular as it relates to the potential uh, dam removal scenario. So we really need to understand thoroughly how much sediment would, would there be uh, in the head pond, 
what is the the chemistry uh, is there if there's any potential contaminants in the sediment and and we've been doing that through um, sonar studies and also then the the crown through thing is done by sediment crabs and and most recently um, taking by taking sediment cores uh, using a viper core or machine so this is um, here you on the lower left you have um, one of our vessels, uh, uh, what we call a sea truck, that we are using for the sonar surveys to collect the bathymetric information that is col uh, collected with a 28 kilohertz sonar. And now I'll show you a couple of um, couple of uh, pictures from the Carl Butler's lab um, about the about the sediments. So they are now the last last year they've used now two or three different methods to try to understand uh, the, the thickness of the sediments in the, in the bottom, bottom of the head pond, but they, uh, they carried these seismic boomer surveys last, last summer, and, and they really seem to be able to decipher uh, the thickness of the sub-bottom layer compared to this uh, old river, river layer here and, and what uh, Carl Butler's a grad student Mitch is doing, he is measuring everywhere in the head pond the differential between the old river bed and the new sub bottom and, and translating that to a depth uh, of sediments. And then of course we're taking these cores, sediment cores to ground through and see how accurate their measurements are. The end product is um, and again this is this is just a very preliminary one. Um, but it is a, a map where we can see how much sediment are in, in different areas of the reservoir and then ultimately come up with um, uh, the total quantity of sediment that would move and, and the grain size based on our grabs and, um, and other methods. I also want to um, mention that the, um, the sediment cores are being used uh, in other party, um, um, parts of studies in the civil engineering um, and to really understand in that uh, under the option three which is the, the potential dam removal scenario so where would these sediments end up if the um, if the dam was uh, was removed and for that purpose um, we obviously will have to do do modeling to try to understand how these uh, fine sediments would, would move downstream. And, and this is work done at the Civil Engineering um, by Dr. Uh, Katie harlan Peters and Dr. Uh, Muhammad Dong. Um, so Muhammad is currently um, 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 modeling the river using a Del 3D model, which, which um, provides the hydrodynamic, hydrodynamic uh, mole velocities, which we can use for our fish habitat mapping, the macrophytes, and many other purposes. But we will also be using this Del3 model for the sediment transport. And the, for the sediment transport, to, to really understand that, uh, Muhammad is now working, we, so we have the Del3 uh, model working in the two dimensions. Uh, in, in all of the rivers, so we had a different model upstream of the dam and different model for downstream of the dam, but now he's uh, integrating a third, um, third dimension, so which is the vertical uh, component of the Delft model, and this model is, is currently so large that we, uh, Muhammad can only run this on the supercomputer, and my understanding, I may be a little bit off here, but my understanding was that we had uh, 480,000 grid cells only for the two-dimensional model and now um, now we're increasing that by by uh, magnitude of five because uh, uh, Muhammad is dividing the water column to five different parcels everywhere in these grids. Another um, study we're doing to understand how that downstream water release would would happen in the, uh, the dam removal scenario we really do need to understand what would happen to the water temperatures um, so this is work done by uh, Professor, uh, Professor Andres San Hilaire and uh, Dr. Stephen Dugla Dug Dugdale. So they've used this SECO uh, semi-distributed process-based model to try to understand the, the temperatures in the, uh, the lower St. John River and also um, 
how the different temperatures would react under different climate change uh, scenarios. So these are all trying to target uh, so that we, we will have a pretty good understanding um, where the where the um, where the fine sediments would end up, and 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 also how the temperatures would change, because obviously these two variables are are of of uh, utmost importance for anything living downstream of the dam, the macroinvertebrates, the fish, the mussels, the macrophytes, and whatnot. So that was the whole ecosystem um, part of the MA studies. So the second second uh, umbrella is around the fish passage studies. So in the St. John River, we have actually quite diverse fish uh, fish species list. So we have documented up to 55 species in the in the St. John River system, and so these are fish species ranging from quite small like black nosed bays to uh, very very large fish like Atlantic sturgeon, and and when we're talking about fish passage for such a wide range of species, um, I think it's easy to understand. It's it's not uh, it's not a trivial task. So what we do or, or what we have done in the fish passage studies is um, we've, we've completed literature reviews, we've consulted experts, and we've written and, and provided these deliverables to NB Power. Um, but we also recognize so that there are a few more detailed studies that we, we really do need to understand and we chose to work on, on six particular species uh, and, and because we thought that there are a few components that, that must be understood before uh, a decision can be made. This is again, by, by us choosing these six species is not to say that the other fish species wouldn't matter. No, we are, are truly considering um, and, and trying to to understand the conceptual fish passage plan um, for for a multi-species fish community, but but these six species we thought there there were some components we, we really needed to understand a little bit better. So so I'll focus a little bit more in this Atlantic salmon in a little bit, but for the for the six other species, what we really are are doing for most of them, we are resorting to acoustic tracking so that we understand their uh, spawning areas, their behavior really well in the uh, in the lower St. John River so that we can we understand what the requirements for, for these species are. So in terms of striped bass, musky and the two species of a sturgeon for example, we're using underwater uh, acoustics to to understand the movement. So this this um, on the right really shows uh, our receiver network. So we currently have 65 receivers deployed uh, in, the, in the area and the, when the tagged individuals are moving between these yellow blobs, they get recorded and we can start to understand how they're using, using the river uh, in different seasons. With regard to American eel, uh, so we are concentrating on the probably the most elusive uh, life uh, or the, the life stage of American eel, which are the elvers. So these are the, um, the little, uh, little juvenile eel that are entering the river from, uh, from the ocean and trying to get to upstream. And we have a graduate student, Brittany Dixon, who is trying to understand uh, how do these elvers navigate in the river system? Where do we find them and how do they uh, use the Mactaquac Dam area in, in more, more detail? Again, so that we can uh, we can prepare and see how what what options would be available for fish passage. The third component of our studies are related to the environmental flow. So that is really studies like how much water and when would 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 be needed for the for the biota in the water. We're using this ecological limits of hydro, hydrological alteration approach, Aloha. Um, and now currently we are at the stage where we have. Uh, consulted um, expert on, on for different flow ecology hypotheses. There was originally we received 500 hypotheses which we have narrowed down to uh, 140 or so. Now we're using this equal evidence approach trying to narrow that list further and, and so that we can come up with um, uh, 
flow, uh, proposed flow regime for the river. And for this purposes, we are com compiling uh, all kinds of uh, data, biological data related to fish, the macroinvertebrates, the plants, the mussels. So, so we know how the, for example, temperatures and discharge are related, and what what these really what really these uh, different species need for uh, during a different uh, stage of their life cycles. But that was really briefly uh, a fast and quick and dirty look on the MAES studies. Uh, but I want to um, just include this this part here uh, where you could uh, find really much more detailed information uh, regarding the May studies. So one place would be the May website uh, indicated here, but but an even better source would be the the May's data and applications database that our uh, GIS manager Bronwyn um, is keeping up. And here's a quick quick um, um, photo of how the interface looks like. So it includes our fieldwork story maps. It, you can access uh, data, what we're collecting. It also has these maps of uh, current and historic conditions uh, in the, in the St. John River where you can have a side-by-side -side view how, uh, how the river looked historically and how, what does it look uh, currently. And it is all publicly um, available from, from this link. So that's where you can find more information. So I will now move on very briefly to focus on the Atlantic salmon part of the MAES studies. So the Atlantic salmon in the St. John River um, is, is a complicated story. Um, uh, historically, it was, it was uh, producing uh, a lot of Atlantic salmon. And, um, and I'm going to show you the, the recent trends on Atlantic salmon in the St. John River in the, in the next slide. But what I want to mention here is that um, Atlantic salmon go to these various tributaries, but particularly um, important area is this Tobik River uh, around here uh, shown on the map that is uh, historically known, it was known to be a major producer of Atlantic salmon in the, in the St. John River system. So the, for the salmon to get to the Tobik River system, there are three main dams, the Mactaquag, the Beachwood, and Tobik Narrows Dam, that the salmon must negotiate both upstream and then to complete their life cycle also downstream. Um, upstream, there is provisional passage for in, in all of th these three dams. It's, it's organized a little bit differently in, in all, all three of them. Uh, currently, there is... Oops, Currently, there is no specific downstream passage um, structures in any of the dams. So the, the, the smolts or the kelts, when they're coming down, they can either go through the spillways or the turbines, but there's no specific bypass. The current um, management strategy in the St. John River in terms of Atlantic salmon is what we call a trap and truck method. So the, the ascending uh, or the migrating adult Atlantic salmon are intercepted here at the Mactaquac. They are put in the, into uh, big tank trucks and they are transported to uh, either between Beachwood and Tobik uh, dams in, in the early part of the season or they are released at the Woodstock. So they are being transported above the, uh, the Mactaquac Reservoir, um, some 60 kilometers uh, upstream of the, of the Mactaquac. SAS intervention, so SAS refers to small to adult supplementation or, or also um, sometimes referred to as captive reared uh, system. So in the St. John River, what, what uh, one of the management strategies currently is to intercept the, the downstream migrating pre-smolts or smolts or, or, or some of them and then bring them to the Mactaquac hatchery to grow, grow them to the adulthood and then release these adults. This is done because the um, the survival or, or the, the highest mortality is really seem to be related to an, an, um, a mortality in the, um, in the oceanic environment. So this strategy is trying to bypass some of the mortality and it's kind of uh, used as a, as a management intervention to, to try to, to help the population and, and boost the numbers. Just to quickly show what, what is going on in terms of trends in Atlantic salmon in St. John River. So historically, when, when the first dams went up in Tobik Narrows, 
the counts were around 30,000, so this comes from the Ruggles and Watt paper in the, in the mid-70s. Uh, the declines were first observed, attributed to the DDT um, release or spraying of chemicals. A bit of a boost after uh, it was learned that those chemicals are not doing any good for salmon. But then again, uh, ever since there has been a bit of a declining trend uh, in the returns to a point that that currently the returns to the Mactaquac station are, are not particularly high. We're talking about um, a couple thousand fish um, maximum annually, or, or in in few years it has been really in in the only in the hundreds most recently. These two uh, red lines indicate uh, when the commercially fishery closed in 1984, and the other line indicates when the and when all including the recreational lab original fishery was closed in the St. John River in 1998. So currently there is no fishery uh, for LN salmon in the St. John River. So the, the studies that MAS is addressing in, in terms of Atlantic salmon is, is really related to, um, and, and, and some of, some of uh, people find it surprising, not really to the passage, the potential passage issues per se at the dam. Uh, we we do think uh, for if if for any species it would be the the salmonids where the passage has been studied perhaps the most, and and um, so if there was a new dam or the repowering uh, option uh, or the op, op or, or sorry option one or or two were chosen. Um, there is a possibility that the passage could be potentially arranged for Atlantic salmon um, for them to go either upstream or potentially downstream. But even if the engineers would come up with a method to arrange a fantastic technology that would pass 100% of the salmon both up and downstream, let's, let's hypo hypothetically say that that was the case, the salmon would still be faced with very large reservoir. And it is this reservoir that we want to focus on because Atlantic salmon migrations are really queuing in on the on the velocity and, and the velocity is giving them the cue of directionality, okay? So this is where I need to be going, I'm, I need to be going upstream or when the smolts are coming, they would give that, that cue uh, of direction for them to get out in the ocean. But in the reservoir, we are creating these lake-like environments and we are trying to understand if potentially the reservoir would be work, uh, functioning as an ecological death trap. Basically trying to, trying to understand would the salmon find their way through the reservoir up and downstream uh, even if a passage at the dam could be resolved. And these are the studies that are currently undertaken uh, by Amanda Babin, so she's carrying out her uh, PhD in the MAES group. Her objectives are, um, well, initially they were to look at the migration rates and success uh, of the different life stages in the reservoir. So these are the, the sea migrating smolts and actually a peculiarity in the, in the St. John River is that we actually have a relatively high pre-smolt component uh, in the Tobik River and also the upstream migrating adults and then the downstream migrating post-spawned adults or Celts. And, and how do they navigate in the reservoir. We, she also wanted to relate those movements to the different depths and temperatures in the Mactaquac Reservoir to understand the movement patterns and how possibly the, uh, the generation in the Mactaquac Dam would be affecting their movement. Currently, we're also starting studies to really try to understand the near-dam behavior of the studies uh, or, or of the salmon, and I'm gonna show you um, couple of slides related to that as well. And as, like any good PhD study, the objectives are just expanding. The more you look into it, the more studies you, you find, oh, we, we really need to understand the kelp overwintering behavior. Oh, now we really need to understand the different uh, management strategies in the, in the multi-dam system like St. John River. So Amanda studies are, are um, expanding for sure. The basic approach to our salmon studies is, uh, as for the for the other fish, is acoustic telemetry. So for the for the little smolts, uh, we are using a seven millimeter V7 Vemco tag to try to decipher their movements through the the, the system. And for the the, the kelts and owls, we're using a larger larger uh, V13 tag. 
And again, like the, uh, the downstream studies, we have peppered the river system with these uh, um, VR2W receivers where we, can, where we can get detections if a fish is passing through. And if I'm, if I'm focusing on the, the uh, actual head, uh, the reservoir proper, so you can see that these black dots represent our, our uh, receivers. So we have arranged our receiver network so that we can, we can uh, try to understand if the fish are spending their time in these different reaches indicated by these different numbers running from one to eight. And, um, and we can see when, when they pass uh, these different checkpoints and, and how they, do they just go, go downstream, for example, as a one pass or, or do they, they go back and forth. And, and I want to uh, um, mention this area number five, what we call a Long's Creek. Um, it is kind of, uh, if you're a smolt coming down the reservoir, the chances are that you end up in the Long's Creek or to really to get out of the reservoir, you, you need to understand to take this left turn here and then out from the dam and downstream from here. So we will look about what happens here in the area five, the Long's Creek as well in the next couple of slides. We just finished uh, carrying out also an undergraduate study by a Lauren, uh, a Lauren Fitzpatrick. So she was actually empirically um, determining the, the detection range of uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the reservoir environment and, and so that we can, we can really trust that uh, we can get good detection in our receiver network for, for both the smolts and the owls migrating in the, in the, the reservoir. In the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll just show a quick uh, couple of bar graphs. Um, and uh, in terms of migration rates, for example, the speed of migration, uh, the data is really showing uh, four different areas. It's showing what is called a river. Um, so the migration rate uh, outside of, of the, um, the reservoir, upstream part of the, uh, of the river where, uh, where the reservoir ends. Then we have, we have divided the reservoir into two different areas. So from, from, the, from the town of Woodstock to the town of Nakwick, the reservoir is more river-like. It, it uh, retains its uh, sort of a narrower uh, form, although it's, it's, it's relatively deep, and it, it, it is definitely in the reservoir part of the, of the river, but it's a, what we call a river-like reservoir. Then we have from, from the town of Nakawik to the dam here at Maktaquak, we have the sort of a lake-like uh, reservoir environment. And then again, when, when the fish go downstream of the, uh, the Maktaquak Dam, they're back to a riverine environment. So that's the, the four different areas that, uh, where we have different, different anal analytical uh, outputs. Um, we generally are looking at three, three um, different life stages, the smolts and pre-smolts, the adults and the post-spawners. For all of the um, all of these groups, we have um, we have done our studies uh, both in 2014 and 15. We are continuing some of the th studies to, uh, to to 2016, and for example, the the pre small studies that we tagged in 2015, those would be the fish that are just about to start their downstream migration as as we speak, uh, and we obviously don't have the data at hand yet for those fish. Similarly, it would be the post spawners. They would have been, would have been tagged in late, late in the fall in 2015, and we don't have that data at hand yet. But this shows you that uh, the numbers we have been able to tag in the different years. And uh, the, the take home here is that we still have a lot of information to come from the fish that are, are currently swimming or, or we are planning to tag uh, for this season. So very quickly, what have we learned about the smolt and pre-smolt migrations in the St. John River? We have learned that the, uh, there is, seems to be a migration delay that the, the reservoir is causing. So in this, this graph, what Matt is showing is the, the migration rate in that upstream, the river, the river part of the upstream um, environment where they are really traveling quite fast, but once the smolts enter this uh, either the river Rhine or the, 
the lake lamp reservoir, their migration rate really slows down um, in the reservoir part. And what we can see in this bar graph, what Amanda is showing here, is these eight different reaches of the lake-like res uh, reservoir environment. And what we can see here, um, so on the y-axis here, is a percent of time spent going upstream. So for a small, this would be the, the, the absolute wrong direction to be going to because you're trying to get downstream to the ocean. And so what we can see here is that in all of the regions in, in, the, in the reservoir, the smolts are actually quite confused. They are reversing their um, downstream migration, so, so they're actually going into upstream direction and uh, are quite confused. So uh, the preliminary analysis shows that up to 14% of the time tracked, uh, the smolts are actually spending going through a wrong direction, the up, upstream direction in all of the regions in, in the reservoir. Not all of them find their way out from the reservoir and then they just can't figure out uh, where Macrocot Dam is and, and how to get downstream from there. The map here uh, shows some of the preliminary data where when, when, for, for those smalls that are able to uh, find the way out, the red crosses are showing um, locations where the migration would have ended. And, and obviously we're not able to say whether or not this would have been natural mortality, perhaps dam-related mortality if you didn't make much away from the dam, but these could be your predation-related events. Similarly to the, uh, the post spawn owls or the Celts, um, we have been able to track them through the, uh, through the reservoir. There's more data coming um, this spring. Um, um, and uh, I guess I suppose I, I forgot to mention this in the in the related to the smolts as well. But this Long Creek area seems to be an area both for the smolts and downstream migrating owls, and also the upstream migrating owls as well, where they where they kind of take a wrong turn and they spend time in this uh, almost like an umbilical cord, a dead end uh, channel, and it takes causes quite some delay before they, they turn tail and, and come out of there and, and figure out uh, a different different migration route. Um, in terms of the Celts, um, so we had out of the 25 tagged in, in 2014, we were able to track 16 to the head pond. And what is interesting is that the four of out of those fish um, were detected by Ocean Tracking Network in their Halifax line out in the uh, in the ocean. Similarly, the smolts, the Celts are also showing that they are they are making these re reversals of migration in the reservoir and, and spending 24 percent of their total time actually uh, going into what can be called a wrong direction. Uh, so they're going upstream when they are really trying to. They need to be getting to the downstream direction. The adult migration, so these are the, the fish trying to get to, to upstream locations to, to spawn. Um, we, are, we are going to repeat the experiments again this summer. We have had a little bit of trouble uh, with tagging. We have been, uh, we're not been able to tag into the peritoneal cavity, what, which we usually do with, with salmon. There's some tagging related concerns there. So we've been using gastric tagging that didn't seem to work. Uh, very well. We used in 2015, we used external tagging, but we, um, we had a bit of a tagging related issue there as well. So our numbers currently are not very high on in terms of adult passage. Uh, what we can, we can tell from the data that we do have in hand currently is that we are seeing uh, a pretty small amount though, but we are seeing fallback when the, when the fish are released in the head pond. Similarly to the Celts and Smalls, we are seeing these reverse milling around. Now this time, you, the fish are trying to get to the upstream, but they are actually showing significant portion of time that they are moving downstream on the head pond. So uh, roughly 20% of the time is spent going downstream. And, and, and this bar graph is showing again, it's, it's really happening throughout the reservoir in all of these uh, eight different reaches. And again, these fish are entering that dead end in the long streak and then get quite confused uh, what is going on in there. So really the take home message for the salmon story currently is that 
both smolts and adults are experiencing microtrolic microtrolic delays in the reservoir and that if we if you're looking at so again in this graph the dam is there and he's this is the reservoir and this is the long streak arm all of these life stages seem to be quite confused and go in this long streak arm which is a dead end and uh, and spending time there some of them never coming out of there potentially because of a predation and which is causing uh, at least some migration delay in, in this particular area of the of the head part. Um, I will do the, uh, I've already spent almost an hour, so I'm just gonna quickly skip our next uh, next steps of, of the study. The studies are ongoing. We're, uh, we have quite some interesting studies that are just about to start in the Atlantic Salmon, but I'm gonna end there. I want to acknowledge again these different organizations giving giving us funding, and uh, I would be happy to answer some questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Tommy. That that was an excellent presentation and a really good overview of what's what's obviously a very significant undertaking. Um, thank you very much. So as Tommy said, we'll now open the session for the question and answer period. So you have a couple of options for asking questions. You can move your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box. If the box is minimized, just hit the orange arrow and that will enlarge it. So um, you have two options. Uh, if you're using the audio of your computer, you can figuratively raise your hand, which is the yellow hand icon with the green arrow, and we'll unmute you so you can ask your question directly uh, to Dr. Lansari. Or you also have the option of typing in your question on the control panel, and we can read it aloud for you. Let's see, so we've already got our first question. Um, <coughs> So uh, William Miller asks, can you please post the ArcGIS link again? So if you could go back to that slide. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think my understanding is that the presentation will be uh, uploaded to um, Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation website. And uh, obviously you will be able to um, get the link from there as well. At, at a later date, when, whenever I get the presentation to Darla. So here is the, um, the link to the database and, uh, and, and uh, MAES website. So Thank probably you. the easy, easiest way is that uh, when, when the presentation is uploaded, so, so people can go and, and find the link from there. Thank you. Um, so I see that uh, Dusan Sudek has uh, a hand raised. So I will unmute the microphone. Uh, is it Dusan or perhaps Susan? Sudek? Uh, do you have a question? Okay, maybe I'll just, I'll give you the option. If you do have a question, uh, please feel free to type it in. Um, our next question comes from Dave Kortmosh. He asks, is there a reason that the... Um, allocenes are not part of the fish passage study. And, and, and this is a common study we get. Um, so allocenes definitely are part of the fish passage studies. We felt at, the, at this time um, there was information uh, related to the allocenes, so the alewife, um, blue duck herring, and the American shad, that, that we felt that uh, we probably can at least on the uh, sort of a comprehensive uh, uh, form pro provide suggestions how the fish passage uh, could be arranged uh, should they should NB power decide to build uh, or, or basically take the either option one or option two so 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 definitely we are not ignoring uh, the allocenes are, are are naturally they they are actually uh, um, well the Gasparo so the two species alewife and, and blueback herring are, are the species that actually have uh, we can we can see that they have actually benefited of having MacTaquac generating station because uh, what what happens is that they um, there, there is now a very large lake like environment so the spawning habitat for these species have been uh, Increased and 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 actually the the 
the returns and the numbers of, of Gaspero um, are, are quite numerous to the dam and part of them are, are currently being moved to the head pond. Um, so, so yes, um, they are being considered and they, and they are a very important component, uh, but we felt that we did not need uh, a detailed study uh, to understand uh, more about, about their ecology. So I don't know if that made any sense, but, but that's, uh, we, we are considering them, but, but not undertaking specific studies at this time. Thank you, Tommy. Um, next question comes from Kimberly John, who asks, are any of the 55 fish species present in the river and or reservoir only there because of the dam? Um, no, I, have to, I haven't tried to think this carefully. Um, well, um, there, there definitely are introductions. There, there, there's no question. There are, um, there are introductions. Of the most recent one is is the muskellunge uh, that was introduced into the the very headwaters of the Saint John River. Um, so, so it's not fair to say that that uh, they would be there because of the dam or because of the reservoir. Um, I can't think of. Of, of a species that would be the direct result of the dam being there. As I, as I alluded to, the spawning habitat really, really increased for, for, for example, the alewife. So now you have a basically a second biggest lake of New Brunswick that is created by the Mactaquac generating station. The spawning habitat for alewife has, has, has increased and, and perhaps resulted in uh, the increase in, at least in that part of the river system. Um, but um, but obviously Elwife is is uh, and always was in the system. So so I don't I don't think there are introductions that that have been caused because of the dam per se. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Jeff Giffen. Jeff first says thank you for this presentation. Um, of the twenty five tag kelt released below Beechwood, only sixteen entered the head pond. Any idea what happened to the nine that did not enter the head pond? Um, I, as, as I alluded to, I'm, I'm actually supervisor of Amanda, Amanda's, um, or Amanda Babin, but, uh, and, and she would know the answer, and, and I don't, but my gut feeling is that, uh, well, ac actually, I shouldn't say it, because I, I do know that there were few receivers between the Beechwood Dam and, and the town of Nakwick that we actually uh, were were unable to retrieve last summer. It's a fairly dynamic environment to be uh, retrieving receivers. We we know where they are, but we couldn't get them. So so all I can say is that there is perhaps more data coming uh, with regard to those missing nine. Um, and uh, other than that, I, I really don't have the information at the hand right now. But but that may be coming. We may be able to solve that mystery. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Reed asks, what is the reason muskie are being considered for fish passage as they are not native to New Brunswick? Muskie was included in the, uh, in the list because as I alluded to, muskie is uh, an introduced predator. We really do need to understand uh, what the muskie is doing and, and the consequences for the native fauna. And also, um, now that it, it is in the system, we want to understand, so, so we know that the muskellunge is, is actually, they have a self-reproducing population upstream of the Mactaquac Dam. What is a little bit unclear is that whether or not muskie already has a self-reproducing population downstream of the dam. And, and we want to really understand the spawning behavior downstream and, and the population dynamics downstream of the dam so we, we can then uh, make the assessment regarding the fish passage that well, uh, do we do we need to entertain that for for uh, that uh, muskie for for fish passage, or perhaps is it is it desirable? And so so we want to have that information for the for the managers. So really the uh, the, the DNR and DFO, so so they can then decide, and and the, the key for starting to making those decision is to know if the self-reproducing populations are are upstream of the dam or are they 
both up and downstream of the dam. Thank you. Uh, John Bagnell asks, for option one, why not recommend no peaking in May and June to prevent smolt and kelp reversal? Um, that is a great, good question. We're actually, um, so my, my, I don't have a clear answer to that yet. Um, just just as, of, as of this week, Amanda finished compiling um, an infographic that shows how the, the small migration historically has been related to the, the spilling uh, at the dam. And, um, and, and, and really, we need a little bit more information so that we can relate the current migration rates, uh, rates and, and the timings to what is happening at the uh, at the Mactaquark Dam. So how is that migration rate related to, for example, uh, generation or peaking regime? And and I don't have a thorough answer to John at, at this time, but I can tell that uh, probably uh, in, in, in a few months, this is, this is actually the exactly what Amanda is uh, currently focusing more on at the moment. So I, I unfortunately don't have the answer right now. But I can I can uh, talk to John about that later when when we actually do have the, the answer. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Bill McMillan. Bill says, "Great presentation. Thanks for the information. Are there any rare plant studies for some of New Brunswick's rare riverine flora?" Ooh, and this would be a good question for for Dr. Megan Bruce because she's our the botanist in house. Um, what I can say about the aquatic macrophytes that uh, it, it is a group of, of biota that that really flies under the radar most of the time. So what I do know that in the MAES study, uh, what Megan has already collected actually has has doubled the university macrophyte collection that we have at hand. So she has collected uh, plants on. Um, over 180 sites, and uh, she is she is documenting um, rare species and and potential. I, I need to say potential uh, introductions because she is yet to run uh, uh, genetics on on the species that she is finding. Um, and and how does it relate to uh, existing information in the province? I I'm not the best expert. That would that would be a question to uh, to Dr. Bruce. Um, I, I have to admit my uh, my ignorance on this topic. <laughs> um, Kimberly John has a second question to ask, part two. Um, how is your study treating uh, with the, with these species that might have benefited from the dam? Sorry, I, I'm not sure if I understood the question. Um, let me just see here. Sorry, questions are coming in fast and furious, and it's changing the uh, changing the order here. So I think I think the question did relate a little bit to the question that you uh, perhaps previously answered about how species that have somewhat benefited from the dam, um, how how they're being assessed as part of the overall study. Well, and and again. Um, what what I have to, what I have to say with regard to um, well I'll, I'll just refer to the two species by Gasparo so so the Gasparo we are not currently doing um, population dynamic study like we are not uh, assessing the population size um, and uh, so it is very difficult for for uh, yeah our, our studies are not addressing what is going on with the population and 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 for example what the uh, production capacity would be in the head pond and uh, and that sort of thing. The current management uh, with regard to Gasparo is that annually um, 800,000 alewife are being transported to the head pond and 200,000 blueback herring and uh, but, but there are definitely more fish that return to the dam but they are not um, they are not moved upstream. Uh, and, and that is uh, again, as, as I think everybody knows, the uh, the fisheries management decisions uh, rest with the, the fisheries and oceans Canada, and um, and um, we we have 
our, our studies are not trying to answer whether or not or what the management strategy should be and at, at this time that that is a DFO um, DFO uh, question um, thank you, Tommy. We have a, a follow-up comment to a previous question from Amanda Babin. Uh, she says, um, I just looked into my data and of the nine other kelps, three were not detected after release and six were last detected in Heartland. Okay. So Perfect. There's some real-time information right there. Well, that's right. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Uh, George Finley asked the question, wouldn't you agree that the salmon population declined with their placement of each dam along their migration route? Ooh, I'm, I will not comment, I will not comment on that. Um, we are actually, one of the reports we're currently compiling, and, and this is one of our technicians, Adam Shadaver, uh, is compiling the historic information. How do the dams relate it? to the, the trends of uh, not only salmon but all the migratory species and uh, I have not yet had a thorough look on the on the history. I would not be the best person to answer that question. Uh, Ross Jones from DFO who is uh, who is uh, managing the Atlantic salmon in the St. John River would be much much better equipped uh, to answer that question. Um, so I will I will not comment on that. Uh, John Bagnell asks, why are upstream tracking studies on maiden adults being done in the head pond? Wouldn't trap and truck be continued in option one? That is a decision that um, we don't know yet. So, so to arrange this passage in a potential new facility, uh, as as far as salmon is concerned. It, it could be arranged by a non-volitional non way, like a, a, a fish lift, where then the fish could be lifted either to the head pond or they could be lifted to a truck and then transported. But also a, a possibility would be to arrange a volitional fish passage, so for example a fish ladder of sorts, where the fish when they arrive at the dam could then enter the fish ladder whenever they want. And, and then that management strategy would be not related to a, a fish lift operator, for example. So it would, in, in a way, that could be a more natural way of, uh, of arranging passage. And, um, and also then, then there are rivers that, that train directly to the, to the head pond. So we thought it, it is better to understand what, if the fish would be able to make it if uh, if a volitional fish passage would be arranged, if that was the um, option that would be chosen, or or then um, would would the fish be better able to enter the rivers like Pokiok, let's say, uh, if if they are actually in the in the um, in the reservoir. So so it is is for those reasons to really try to understand um, if the salmon do have the capability of navigating through the reservoir, no problem, or, or is it going to be an, an actual issue? We thought it's, it's, it's really important to know before, before proposing something. For example, if, we, uh, if, if the decision would be made, okay, we will, there will be a volitional fist passage, but then the data from the reservoir show that, well, the salmon are really confused in the reservoir, it would be a poor, it would be a really poor decision to make. Thank you. John asked the follow-up question, do elvers make it into the head pond currently? American eel is not currently managed uh, at Mactor Park, so the answer is no. Okay, thank you. Uh, a comment comes in, excellent presentation, and the inquiry whether or not the PowerPoint will be available for download. And yes, we will be posting uh, both the PowerPoint and a recording of the full webinar on, our, on the um, Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation website. Jeff Given asks the question, curious if sea lampreys are being considered as part of the passage studies. Are the currently passed are they currently passed upstream at Mactaquack and Beechwood? And is there much historical knowledge of their presence before the dam? Lampreys provide valuable nutrients and movement of spawning sub substrate. I, I agree on this position. Um, it is very important to note that all the migratory species do have that uh, sort of uh, 
marine derived nutrient component that they have and, and, and must be considered. Um, so as far as the lamprey is concerned, we don't, we didn't have the capacity to currently look at that. We have compiled the trends uh, that we could find on the, on the different dams. From the top of my head, I can't remember the actual numbers, but the, the lamprey story is, um, is, is quite, quite sad. Uh, first of all, in, historically, when uh, Tobique was, was constructed and when Beechwood was constructed, uh, the lamprey were deliberately um, taken from the fish uh, capturing facilities and actually destroyed. Um, and, and what we could see from the, from the trend that, that such an action really quickly uh, decimated these populations. And um, currently at the, at the Mactaquac uh, collection facility, there isn't a whole lot of lamprey that are being captured. The DFO is keeping track of the numbers and we have a trend, so the, the, one of the deliverables we are, as I said, uh, we're, we're just about to, um, to finalize uh, is showing the trend on, on lampreys and um, um, there, there isn't, isn't a whole lot. Now, um, that is not to say, again, uh, since there hasn't been any acoustic study, it's not to say that it would not be related to just an uh, inability of the current facility to actually attract them and, and uh, capture them, so we don't know that. Thank you. Um, question from Bill McMillan, what are some of the hypotheses regarding migration reversals within the current head pond? Um, well, it is a little bit too early to say, and Amanda, this is, this is one of the questions Amanda is trying to understand, that why is this happening and, and relating those reversals to um, to what is happening at the dam. Uh, I don't think she knows the answer yet. I certainly don't. Uh, but but the, um, the current plan is when we have that hydrodynamic model, the DEL3 model ready, so there is, there is a, a separate model that Mohammed is building for the, uh, for the head pond. The idea is then to link the, um, the water flow to those migrations and try to see if we can detect a pattern there uh, so that, well, if, if certain operation routines are being undertaken at the dam, does that translate to uh, something we can detect in the migration? So we have not had the time yet to do that and partially we didn't want to do it either because uh, we still have so much information coming in so it's easier to do it, it, it at once when we have all the information collected. So, so uh, I, I guess I, I don't have the answer to that yet, but it is coming. Uh, Bill asked a follow-up question. Have reversals been observed in other head ponds? Um, and my answer to that, and I'm sorry to just say I don't know, but again, one of the, one of the uh, papers Amanda is currently writing is uh, a rather extensive review of of salmon migration in uh, in um, no. hydropower reservoirs. So she does have the answer because she has now just compiled reading all the information that there is. Uh, but again, me as a supervisor, I seem to know nothing. <laughs> so um, I, I will, um, I'm, that question can be asked from Amanda and, and she surely knows the answer. Amanda writes, the short answer is yes, reversals are sometimes common. So there we go. So that seems to be the last of the questions. Um, thank you very much, Tommy, again, for an excellent presentation. Um, and to everyone who participated, I think this may be one of our most lively question and answer sessions. Um, so just to let folks know, the next presentation in our webinar series will be on April 20th next week. Amy Weston of Nova Scotia Adopt-A-Stream will present a talk entitled How to Assess Culverts for Fish Passage, an Introduction. This presentation will be in English, but the question and answer session will be bilingual. Registration and a listing of webinars is available on both the Foundation um, and the CRI websites. Thank you to everyone to participating today, and again, a huge thank you to Tommy. We hope you'll all be joining us again very soon. Well, thanks for having me.